Hello everybody, I'm trying for a daytime one and welcome back to my lounge. Um, as you can see, I still haven't really tidied it in the background there, so there's lots of books bombing around. Um, we also have a ball of sun in the corner where my hand just disappeared into, so apologies, I can't do anything about that lighting. Today uh, we're continuing with vampires and what I'm going to be reading for you today is something that's perhaps a little less well known, maybe, maybe not. So very famously, one of the first, if not the first, sort of short stories about the vampire and the one that really introduced as a, as, um, a common figure, this aristocratic vampire, is William Polidori's The Vampire from 1819. Now, most people are quite familiar with that. Many of you will have read it. Um, the one that I'm wanting to read for you today is only a fragment, but it's the original Byron vampire story upon which Polidori based his own version. So as you will know, as I've talked about before, um, this all dates back to the Via Diodati, where you had the Shelleys and Byron and Polidori all entering that ghost story writing competition. Byron started this story and just gave up on it really. And then Polidori took it, ran with it and made it more of an anti-Byronic tale. Something I'm gonna be talking about on Saturday is these differences in the portrayal of the vampiric figure between Byron's own work and Polidori's adaptation of it. Anyway, it's not too long. I hope you will enjoy it with me. Um, and I might give a little bit of a, a summary or a point at the end. So stick around for that as well. <laughs> in the year 17, having for some time determined on a journey through countries not hitherto much frequented by travellers, I set out, accompanied by a friend whom I shall designate by the name of Augustus Darvel. He was a few years my elder and a man of considerable fortune and ancient family, advantages which an extensive capacity prevented him alike from undervaluing or overrating. Some peculiar circumstances in his private history had rendered him to me an object of attention, of interest, and even of regard, which neither the reserve of his manners nor occasional indications of an inquietude, at times nearly approaching to alienation of mind, could extinguish. I was yet young in life, which I had begun early, but my intimacy with him was of a recent date, we had been educated at the same schools and university, but his progress through these had preceded mine, and he had been deeply initiated into what is called the world, while I was yet in my novitiate. While thus engaged, I had heard much both of his past and present life, and although in these accounts there were many and irreconcilable contradictions, I could still gather from the whole that he was a being of no common order, and one who, whatever pains he might take to avoid remark, would still be remarkable. I had cultivated his acquaintance subsequently and endeavoured to obtain his friendship, but this last appeared to be unattainable. Whatever affections he might have possessed seemed now, some to have been extinguished and others to be consented. But his feelings were acute I had sufficient opportunities of observing, for although he could control, he could not altogether disguise them. Still he had a power of giving to one passion the appearance of another in such a manner that it was difficult to define the nature of what was working within him. And the expression of his features would vary so rapidly, though slightly, that it was useless to trace them to their sources. It was evident that he was a prey to some cureless disquiet. But whether it arose from ambition, love, remorse, grief, from one or all of these, or merely from a morbid temperament akin to disease, I could not discover. There were circumstances alleged which might have justified the application to each of these causes. But as I have before said, they were so contradictory and contradicted that none could be fixed upon with accuracy. Where there is mystery, it is generally supposed that there must also be evil. I know not how this may be, but in him there certainly was the one, though I could not ascertain the extent of the other, and felt loath, as far as regarded himself, to believe in its existence. My advances were received with sufficient coldness, but I was young, and not easily discouraged, and at length succeeded in obtaining to a certain degree that commonplace intercourse and moderate confidence of common and everyday concerns, created and cemented by similarity of pursuit and frequency of meeting, which is called intimacy, friendship, according to the ideas of him who uses those words to express them. Darvel had already traveled extensively, and to him I had applied for information with regard to the conduct of my intended journey. It was my secret wish that he might be prevailed on to accompany me, it was also a probable hope founded upon the shadowy restlessness which I had observed in him, and to which the animation which he appeared to feel on such subjects, and his apparent indifference to all by which he was more immediately surrounded, gave fresh strength. 
This wish I first hinted and then expressed. His answer, though I had partly expected it, gave me all the pleasure of surprise. He consented. And after the requisite arrangements, we commenced our journey voyages. After journeying through various countries of the south of Europe, our attention was turned towards the east, according to our original destination. And it was in my progress through those regions that the incident occurred upon which will turn what I may have to relate. The constitution of Darville, which must from his appearance have been in early life more than usually robust, had been for some time gradually giving way. Without the intervention of any apparent disease, he had neither cough nor hectic, yet he became daily more enfeebled. His habits were temperate, and he neither declined nor complained of fatigue, but yet he was evidently wasting away. He became more and more silent and sleepless, and at length so seriously altered that my alarm grew proportionate to what I conceived to be his danger. We had determined on our arrival at Smyrna on an excursion to the ruins of Ephesus and Sardis, from which I endeavoured to dissuade him in his present state of indisposition, but in vain. There appeared to be an oppression on his mind, and a solemnity in his manner which ill corresponded with his eagerness to proceed on what I regarded as a mere party of pleasure, little suited to a valetudinarian. But I opposed him no longer, and in a few days we set off together, accompanied only by a serigee and a single janissary. We had passed halfway towards the remains of Ephesus, leaving behind us the more fertile environs of Smyrna, and were entering upon that wild and tenantless track through the marshes and defiles which lead to the few huts yet lingering over the broken columns of Diana, the roofless walls of expelled Christianity, and the still more recent but complete desolation of abandoned mosques, when the sudden and rapid illness of my companion obliged us to halt at a Turkish cemetery. The turbaned headstone, tombstones, of which were the sole indication that human life had ever been a sojourner in this wilderness. The only caravan sera we had seen was left some hours behind us. Not a vestige of a town or even cottage was within sight or hope. And this city of the dead appeared to be the sole refuge for my unfortunate friend, who seemed on the verge of becoming the last of its inhabitants. In this situation, I looked round for a place where he might more conveniently repose. Contrary to the usual aspect of Mahometan burial grounds, the cypresses were in this few in number, and these thinly scattered over its extent. The tombstones were mostly fallen, worn with age. Upon one of the most considerable of these, and beneath one of the most spreading trees, Darvel supported himself, in a half-reclining posture, with great difficulty. He asked for water. I had some doubts about being able to find any, and prepared to go in search of it with hesitating despondency, but he desired me to remain, and turned to Solomon our janissary, who stood by us, smoking with great tranquillity, and he said, Solomon, Babanasu i.e. bring some water, and went on describing the spot where it was to be found with great minuteness at a small well for camels a few hundred yards to the right. The Janissary obeyed, and I said to Darvel, well, how did you know this? He replied, from our situation, you must perceive that this place was once inhabited and could not have been so without springs. I've also been here before. You've been here before? How came you never to mention this to me? And what could you be doing in a place where no one would remain a moment longer than they could help it? To this question, I received no answer. In the meantime, Suleiman returned with the water, leaving the serigee and the horses at the fountain. The quenching of his thirst had the appearance of reviving him for a moment, and I conceived hopes of his being able to proceed, or at least to return, and I urged the attempt. He was silent and appeared to be collecting his spirits for an effort to speak. He began. This is the end of my journey and of my life. I came here to die, but I have a request to make, a command, for such my last words must be. You will observe it. Most certainly, but have better hopes. I have no hopes nor wishes but this. Conceal my death from every human being. I hope there will be no occasion that you will recover in peace. It must be so. Promise me. I, I do. Swear it. By all that. Here he dictated an oath of great solemnity. There is no occasion for this. I will observe your request. And to doubt me is... 
cannot be helped. You must swear. I took the oath. It appeared to relieve him. He removed a seal ring from his finger on which were some Arabic characters and presented it to me. He proceeded. On the ninth day of the month, at noon precisely, what month you please, but this must be the day, you must fling this ring into the salt springs which run into the Bay of Eleusis. The day after, at the same hour, you must repair to the ruins of the Temple of Ceres and wait one hour. Why? You will see. The ninth day of the month, you say? The ninth. As I observed that the present was the ninth day of the month, his countenance changed and he paused. As he sate, evidently becoming more feeble, a stork with a snake in her beak perched upon a tombstone near us, and without devouring her prey, appeared to be steadfastly regarding us. I know not what impelled me to drive it away, but the attempt was useless. She made a few circles in the air and returned exactly to the same spot. Davil pointed to it and smiled. He spoke. I know not whether to himself or me, but the words were only, "'Tis well." What is well? What do you mean? No matter. You must bury here, me here this evening, and exactly where that bird is now perched. You know the rest of my injunctions. He then proceeded to give me several directions as to the manner in which his death might be best concealed. After these were finished, he exclaimed, You perceive that bird? Certainly. And the serpent, writhing in her beak? Doubtless, sir. There's nothing uncommon in it. It is her natural prey. But it is odd that she does not devour it. He smiled in a ghastly manner and said faintly, it is not yet time. As he spoke, the stork flew away. My eyes followed it for a moment. It could hardly be longer than 10 might be counted. I felt Davil's weight, as it were, increase upon my shoulder and turning to look upon his face, perceived that he was dead. I was shocked with the sudden certainty which could not be mistaken. His countenance in a few minutes became nearly black. I could have attributed so rapid a change to poison had I not been aware that he had had no opportunity of receiving it unperceived. The day was declining, the body was rapidly altering, and nothing remained but to fulfil his request. With the aid of Suleiman's Attigan and my own sabre, we scooped a shallow grave upon the spot which Darvel had indicated. The earth easily gave way, having already received some Mohammedan tenant. We dug as deeply as the time permitted us, and throwing the dry earth upon all that remained of the singular being so lately departed, we cut a few sods of greener turf from the less withered soil around us, and laid them upon his sepulchre. Between astonishment and grief, I was tearless. So, that's where he ended the story. Um, we're not really into the vampire territory yet, perhaps, or it's not clear, but we will be, presumably. I think one of the main interesting differences for me there is that this vampire is quite clearly a Byronic hero um, of sorts, or a Byronic anti-hero. He um, is mysterious, perhaps has some crime to him, but it doesn't go into the detail which Polidori's later, later story does about this vampiric figure as a corrupter and a degenerate and a monster. So this is a more sort of truly Byronic vampire than the one perhaps we're more familiar with from Polidori's Finnish story. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it's given you something to think about. And um, we'll be talking about it more on Saturday if you come along. And if these classes happened long, long in the past, by the time you get to this video, you should be able to check out the Vampire Lecture in my online classes playlist. Goodbye.